But in spite of everything, we never lose our faith in the future. We believe in the future. We build for the future. Yes, we build for the future. And the future always catches up with us. Before we're done building, we've developed something new and have to start rebuilding. That's roughly the kind of people we are. Boastful, easygoing, sentimental, but underneath passionately dedicated to the ideal our forefathers passed on to us, the liberty and dignity of man. We've made great material progress, but spiritually we're still in the frontier days. Yet deep down within us, there is a great yearning for peace and goodwill toward men. Somehow we feel that if men turn their minds toward the fields of peace, as they have toward the fields of transportation, communication, or aviation, wars would soon be as old-fashioned as the horse and buggy days. We hate war. We know that in war it's the common man who does the pain, the suffering, the dying. We bend over backwards to avoid it. But let our freedoms be endangered, and we'll pay and suffer and fight to the last man. That is the America. That is the way of living for which we fight today. Why? Is that fight necessary? Did we want war? In 1917, before most of you fighting men were born, our fathers fought the first world war to make the world safe for democracy, for the common man. They fought a good fight and won it. There was to be no more war in their time or their children's time. Faithful to our treaty obligations, we destroyed much of our naval tonnage. Our army went on a reducing diet until it became little more than a skeleton. For us, war was to be outlawed. For us, Europe was far away. And as for Asia, well, that was really out of this world, where everything looked like it was torn from the National Geographic. Yet, in this remote spot in Asia, in 1931, while most of you were playing ball in the sandlots, this war started. Without warning, Japan invaded Manchuria. Once again, men who were peaceful became the slaves of men who were violent. In Washington, D.C., our Secretary of State made a most vigorous protest. The American government does not intend to recognize any situation, treaty or agreement, which may be brought about by means of aggression. But we the people hadn't much time to think about Manchuria. We were wrestling with the worst depression in our history. Some of us were out of jobs. Some of us stood in bread lines. Some of us suffered homemade aggression. Some of us were choked with dust. Some of us had no place to go. Two years later, in 1933, while most of you were graduating from high school, we read that a funny little man called Hitler had come into power in Germany. We heard that a thing called the Nazi Party had taken over. Today we rule Germany, tomorrow the world. What kind of talk was that? It must be only hot air. In 1935, about the time you had your first date, we read that strutting Mussolini had attacked far off Ethiopia. The disease seemed to be spreading, so Congress assembled to insulate us against the growing friction of war. We want no war. We'll have no war. 
save in defense of our own people or our own honor. Toward this end, our chosen representatives passed the Neutrality Act. No nation at war could buy manufactured arms or munitions from the United States. In 1936, when you were running around in jalopies, we were disturbed by news from Spain. In our newsreels, we saw German and Italian air forces and armies fighting in Spain and wondered what they were doing there. For the first time, we saw great cities squashed flat, civilians bombed and killed. In November 1936, the American Institute of Public Opinion, known as the Gallup Poll, asked a representative cross-section of American people, if another war develops in Europe, should America take part again? No. 95%. We the people had spoken. 19 out of 20 of us said, include us out. To further insulate ourselves, we added a cash and carry amendment to the Neutrality Act. Not only wouldn't we sell munitions, but we wouldn't sell anything at all, not even a spool of thread, unless warring powers sent their own ships and paid cash on the line. In 1937, the press services received a flash from Asia. 